we're going to talk the second step. And uh, Cornelia is going to start off talking about ant navigation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. It's yeah, it's really nice to be here today. And I will start with some early work that Mike has done together with Tom in the mid 70s. And they have done experiments on hoverflies, and they were actually one of the first people who have showed that those hoverflies, they use spatial memory in order to return back to, to a point they came from. So I'm not going into detail because Tom will talk more about it later on, but they have filmed those hoverflies and have shown that they use visual information in order to return back to where they started the chase. And this is one figure from the paper, and they show her film and have tracked different parts, and those flies always end up in a similar location. And this depends as well on how the visual cues are around those places. So if there are lots of close by visual cues, they are more accurate in order to return than if it's in a more open, open area. And yeah, in a similar spirit later on, work was done on, on ants, and we see similar behavior in ants than what we have seen. And on the previous slide for hover flies, so those ants also um, remember places and they go back to important places, as for instance here. We see a desert experiment where they learn to associate the location of the feeder with the um, with, with those three cylinders, and they use this external visual information to learn that place. And if those cylinders together with the ant is moved to a to a pasture where there is no, no feeder. We see that they are searching around the place the feeder should be, so we get these really nice search peaks. And if these cylinders are moved further away, they appear too small on the end sweat, you know, so there is no space, no location in this space that appears correct. So we don't get a, a location that are actually searching for it. But if the um if the cylinders are moved further away and they are enlarged in size, they again appear correctly. So again, here we have the search and we can peak again and ends are searching for their feeder in the center of those cylinders. And yeah, so this is work that was done in, in desert ants in the field. But over the last few years, we got lots of knowledge on ant navigation on, on wood ants on work that was done in the lab. And we see similar, so this is a similar experiment where those wood ants learn to localize a feeder in the center of two cylinders. And what we have seen before as well, if for instance, the cylinders in a test have a different size, so one is smaller and one is bigger, those ends, they, they they fixate a lot on, on the small one and they are approaching the small one much more than the bigger one because this is the space where the visual cues they have learned appear correctly. So we see how the paths are then shaped towards the smaller one. <coughs> and there's a series of experiments that were done in the lab around um, Tom Collins and Tom Graham in the last few years. And by looking at the past details, we have learned a lot how they use their eyes for navigation and how they are looking at visual cues and how those visual cues are controlling their paths and as well how how, how they control for um, for errors by having really quick rotations and so on. So we learn quite and we, we know quite a lot about their visual navigation mechanisms in these lab conditions, but what we know less well is how they actually navigate in, in natural um, conditions. And that's why we um, went to the forest last year and we did an experiment where we looked at how they actually navigate through clots of natural habitats. And here on this picture, we see um, the habitat of, of, of the woodlands. So they have these nest mounds and they navigate along those shared trails and shared, yeah, along those shared trails to trees where they go up and get honeydew from aphids. So we have those. Um, quite complex habitats and we have those um, foraging trees they are navigating on. And looking at other animals, we know from, from different animals that they can follow, they can learn and follow idiosyncratic routes. So animals use and learn environmental information in order to um, guide their paths. So here, for instance, on the top, we have an example of pigeons. So we have a, a start and an end. And if you look at those blue paths, there are a couple of paths from the same pigeon. And this pigeon doesn't fly the direct field like between start and end, but it really learns and follows a specific route. And it repeatedly does the same over time, even though it could fly on a direct line to the target. 
And similar um, behavior we see in, in desert dance. So here we have a desert dance that inhabits a semi open desert environment. And here we have a nest and here a feeder, and those are two different ends. And we have two paths from both ends. And they are almost following exactly the same route. And in those ends, they don't have thermal trails, or in this experiment, they also don't have partial integration anymore because they will move back to the feeder again. So they need to learn in, um, features from the environment in order to be able to um, follow again and again the same route. So we are asking the same question if those ends that inhabit these really complex environments and navigate a lot of those shared trails, if they do the same. So we were taking ends that just came down from the foraging tree, and then we filmed them with a handheld camera up to the moment they were at the nest. And before they entered the nest, we moved them back to the, to the bottom of the tree, and we filmed them a second time. And then again, we moved them back to the tree and recorded them as a third time. So we got for every end, M3 homing pass, and the videos that we recorded from those. And this is the video how they look <laughs> when we get them. So as you can see, it's quite hard to actually see the end. And that's <laughs> one, of the, one of the reasons this experiment wasn't done before. <laughs> But yeah, our end is up here. So we gave them a little color dot so that we didn't lose them by following the end. But um, luckily, there were some recent developments in, in tracking algorithms. And we were collaborating with people from um, Edinburgh and the University of Münster in Germany. And they have recently um, developed and published a tracking algorithm with which you can track animals and reconstruct their, their um, 2D environment. And this is one example of one of those ends. So down here, there would be the tree, and then we have three parts of the same end up to the moment she's in the nest. And as you can see, there's lots of overlap in this individual parts. There's a bit of um, variation, but still this end follows the same similar pattern. And this is another example where an end almost identically three times follow the same path. And here we have a few more examples. So those are five different, different ends that we have tracked. And here in gray, those are the paths from all of the ends we have tracked. So we have tracked 20 ends, 20 ends times we um, pass. So they are all walking back somewhere in the corridor that is roughly four so meters wide. Right. But then different ends have different roots. But at the beginning end, we see a strong overlap of the roots. So they do follow idiosyncratic roots if they are navigating back along this, along this corridor, which then leads to the to the um, to the question that or to the so, so so that makes us realizing that those brains actually need to deal with the huge amounts of memory if they are able to have these idiosyncratic roots. Can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you said that the paths look very similar, and I agree, but the scale bar is like one meter, right? So it's sometimes half a meter apart. And I guess for an end, wouldn't that look completely different? So we will, I will show some pictures how it actually looks in the different yeah. places. So yeah, I agree they, are, they have some variation, but if we compare how similar the paths are from one end, it's more similar than if we compare with all the other ones. But yeah, you sometimes have some, I mean, this is this is 12 meters long, and so so this can be 40 centimeters between, or yeah, there's some variation. So they are not perfect to follow the same route, but they are more similar than when looking at all of the paths. So that means they somehow need to remember all those places. And here we have an example of one end. So this specific end, this is a section along the homing pass. She always ends up here. Here there's a bit of variation. And here, in this case, this end three times ends up in, in, in the same location. And if we now look at the images or the panoramic pictures, we how the world looks at those places, we can start to think about why this is the case. So here in yellow, we have highlighted the pictures we will see at, at this point and in red the pictures we will see at the other point. 
So we put the pen and, and camera on, on the ground. And here in the middle, it's where the other ends up. This is how the belt would look 26 centimeters to the left or to the right. And when we now focus on the yellow location, so we have here on the top the left location, here we have the middle location, and here we have the right location. And this is sampled down a bit so that it's more similar how the ends sees it. And we haven't done any proper analysis on that yet, but as you can see, it looks rather similar. <clears throat> if we go to the other um, location, we again have the, so in the center is the location there and always ends up. Here it looked this, how it would look 20 centimeters to the left. This is how it would look 20 centimeters to the right. And again, it's looking rather similar, but then we also see some differences. So like there are some differences in some parts of the of the panorama. So the, 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 and the, how different or how similar similar the parts are in a specific location might depend on how similar the world looks a bit to the left or to the right, or if it's really distinctive. And knowing that the ants need to deal with so much, so many memories, we can also ask where this memory is actually stored. So we had a different uh, set of experiments where we um, investigated where, where those ants actually store um, memory. And we were focusing on, on the central complex and, and the mushroom bodies. And I give you a, a quick summary of the projects we have done on, on the mushroom body. So the mushroom bodies are known from other insects that they are important in, in mainly in papers. What we have learned from that is that they are important for olfactory associations. And we know less about how they are actually involved in, in long-term visual memories. And those ants, they both get olfactory and visual input in their mushroom bodies. So we were asking what the role of those mushroom bodies in the visual memory of those ends. And for doing that, we did um, chemical lesions. So we had an experiment where we could train our ends in the lab in this, on this platform from the center to a feeder that was offset of a signal visual cue. And then we recorded the past before and after the lesion. And before any head training is happening, if you only release the ends that are noisy in the setup. So this is the behavior and um, arena and here we have the visual cue. We see that most of the ends are ending up at some point at, at the visual cue. So they have this innate attraction to a visual cue. But if we train them to a feeder that is away from the visual cue, we get cars that look like that after a while. So they learn to use this visual information in order to navigate to a feeder location. And with those well-trained ends, we then can go to the next step, which is doing a, a chemical emission in the mushroom body and then see how this affects their, their visual memory. And this is what we found. So those were the ends that we were able to accurately <laughs> navigate to the feeder location. We took them, we injected a small amount of um, cocaine hypochlorite, which is a local anesthetic that can yeah, be injected and it's it's coupled with a fluorescent dye. So later on we can localize where the infection actually has happened. And if those ends are released again in their familiar um, surrounding, we see that they are no longer able to go to the feeder. So in this case here, we only had two out of almost 20 ends that, was, that were still going to the feeder location. And most of the other ends, they, they switched towards the left, which is their innate response. So we were also asking if this is actually a motor bias or if this is caused by the, um, the loss of the visual memory. So we had a new set of ends that was now trained to the other side of the visual cue. So we started with the training again, which lets them learn to use the visual information to navigate to the feeder location. And then we did exactly the same lesion again. And what we found in this, Set of experiment was thus was the same, so they were not anymore able to navigate to the feeder location. But in this case, they now um, switch towards the right again towards the visual cue. So it's not a, a motor bias of turning more often to the left or to the right and 
this is not how the, the parts are um, shifting, but it's actually they switch from their learned to their innate response. If, if the mushroom body is not fully functioning. And an additional um, test we did was instead of doing the lesion, we, we covered the eye with paint. And so the ants were normally trained to the feeder, and then we covered the eye and we covered their pass again. And what we see here is that most of those ants are still able to navigate to the feeder. So that means that the mushroom body lesion we have done is not the same as an absence of the peripheral visual input. And yeah, so in, in this slide, it's, it was um, summarized by Stanley Heinze, and this also nicely shows. So we are doing our brain missions in the input region of the mushroom body, the policies. And at the same time, there was another team about H.A. November who did lesions in the mushroom body output region. So they have done the lesion here in the vertical lobe. And similar to what we have found was that Again, ants that were perfectly able to navigate accurately before the lesion were completely lost after the lesion was done. So the entire mushroom body needs to be um, functional in order for the ants to be accurate in visual navigation. In the in the last few slides, I go um move on to the next question that we can ask them as well. So if they have those idiosyncratic roots, and we know that the visual memory is stored in the mushroom body, we can also ask how they actually learn those roots. And this was an experiment that was done a couple of years back. And the, the general setup of this experiment that we have done with desert ants was that we had a nest and we placed the feeder in the field that in this case was eight meters away from the feeder. And then we let the ants establish the route. So they were walking back and forth. And after they have established the route, we recorded their homing path. And then later on, we have introduced a track. So this was a channel that was digged into the ground. So it was in the ground, which meant the ants didn't see it up to the moment they actually fell in. So Ants normally walk back home, and at this point, they suddenly fell into the channel that was perpendicular to the homing route. And because this channel only had a single exit, they spent quite a while in this channel until they finally found the exit, and then were able to walk back home. So it was a, a negative experience they had because they spent a lot of time in this in this channel finding the exit. If we then kept this setup for another day. We saw, if we look at the homing path of those ants again, that they have developed new routes. So some ants have learned to efficiently go into the channel somewhere close to the exit and then go out quite quickly. While others have learned routes that either leads them along the left, left side or along the right side of this channel. We then went into more detail because what's Known in ants is that they often show this um, scanning behavior, which is a moment the ant stops and rotates on the spot. And often this is done when ants are alarming or when we are unfamiliar with the situation. So we were looking at this scanning behavior in those parts, which is an indicator where learning is actually happening. And this is what we found. So here on the left, we see a schematic drawing of the setup. So we have the feeder here, and so walking home. This is the first part of the route. Here we have the track, and then in red, we have the second part of the homing route until they end up in the nest. And then we counted the number of scans they are doing in those different parts of the route, which is shown here. So here we have the number of scans, and this is the frequency it happens. And those two graphs show if there is no track, so they are normally walking back. Most of the ants usually, they, they don't tend to scan. So most of the ants have zero scans in both parts of the route. If we now open the track for the first time, the first half of the homing route is normal as always. And here we see they are not scanning. And then they are in the track for a while. If they are coming out of the track, the behavior in the second half of the route is, is not different. 
But interestingly, if they are now back at the feeder later on again, so they have their second homing part, so they will fall the second time into the track. We see that the behavior is changing. So in this first half of the of the homing route, when they walk again towards the track, they start to do lots of scanning. So this is the moment they start to relearn their route. Once they are in the track and they are out of the track, we see again the second half is the same. So that means that ants do remember the last views they had before they fell into the track previously. And when they are encountering those views again, they change their behavior, which is a kind of a trace conditioning because it's it, it, it happened before the negative event has happened. And then over time, the new roots become um, positively and reinforced again. And over time, those new roots will, will emerge. So we have here like, so it's a, it's a combination of repetitive learning and aggressive based learning. So here we have all these areas that are later between where repetitive learning is happening. But if they are falling into the trap for the first time, they have here this, um, this aversive phrase learning. So they have this location that is just before the negative event. And this is the area where the, the, real, the learning is happening. So this is the area where all the scans are happening. And then over time, they start to become, they start to develop a new route and the, and the scanning is, is stopping again. And they are kind of, <coughs> they have a new route, but they are again in a, in a situation as they were previously, but in a new location. And yeah, to finish up, this is a um, way how this could all work. So we have ants that, that they experience a view and the projection neurons, they then project onto the canyon cells and we have the motion body output neurons. And what usually happens is that the views are either um, associated with positive or negative balances. And this can happen through modulation of the synaptic rates between the canyon cells and the motion body output neurons, which happens um, through the dopaminergic neurons. And in the case of, of the ant being trapped, this is a negative event. So in this case, the dopaminergic neurons, they can decrease the connection strengths between the, um, the canyon cells and the repetitive motion body output neurons. And then this balance between repetitive and aversive motion body output neurons um, controls the steering, which then controls the traction or impulsion. And yeah, so yeah, that's, that's all from my side. And yeah, I would like to thank all the people I was working on in, in this project, both here from Sussex and the collaborators from all the universities in Minister of Edinburgh and Toulouse. And yeah, thank you. Any question? Yeah. Yeah, we didn't go in this experiment back down to the detail where they're looking at the different moments. Right. But yeah, that's yeah, this diff maybe we will see this difference that they are stationary looking like yeah, but it's it's different types of looking and storing and memorizing controlled by the walking speed. Uh, so, so come here. So, after falling into the trap, the, the first uh, next attempt, they start scanning, yeah. you called it, to uh, um, uh, before uh, some distance before getting yeah. to the I just wonder what the time scale is. So, I'm trying to get an idea of uh, the, 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 the time scale of the memory yeah. engram, or whatever you yeah. call it, that the, 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 the ants establishing. Yeah. yeah. We don't have the exact time, but it's a couple of seconds. 
at least like a second or a okay. bit more. Right. Okay. Less than a goldfish. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> That's a related question, Jill. So about the, the scanning, could you actually look whether they scan after they have held? Because, you know, it's a big event. Yeah. Maybe they, they want to figure out where what, yeah. did this happen. Yeah. So maybe look back. Yeah. Where, so then recognize it yeah. again, because it's quite amazing that they would recognize it the next time around, yeah. which is much further yeah. in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've looked at that. We looked at the scanning all the way, but they didn't change the behavior once they came out of the channel. Can they see stuff <laughs> in the channel? It's it's relatively deep, so they have mostly sky above them. So the view is different to to what they experience on the surface of the ground. <laughs> Wondering uh, about other other information that the animal may have, um, uh, you know, at uh, that particular instant, for instance, in terms of that spot that you put in the, in the diagram, whether the texture of the, of the ground, of the landscape, or whether scent, pheromones, and other other elements could also constrain that. Yeah. With respect to an elevated primordial condition. Yeah. So I mean. So other work has shown they can use other sensors as well, for instance, olfactory cues, but it is quite like the ground is relatively the same all over the place. So it's hard to say if they have learned anything else than the visual cues because they have the visual panorama, but then for instance, the ground structure is quite identical. And and I, and I guess, yeah, so, so it's it's possible that they have learned some other information, but yeah, but yeah, we think that vision is the main main factor. And one more. So, do they uh, use also an anosentric map or the environment, uh, uh, like, uh, or, or do they simply have a anosentric position on the map? So can you say the beginning? Yeah, it, it's mainly like matching their current view with with, with my voice from their point of view. Thanks a lot. Well, once you our next speaker is Morgan Prop from the Imperial College of London. And he has a title that I gave him the speaker, which will be about it's a life of vision. Uh -huh.